code makes the world smaller and our horizons broader. Driving every corner of our global economy is code. In this series, we look under the hood at today's most dynamic open source software with the people behind it. This is Decoded. In this episode, we hit the slopes of Snowbird, Utah with the US ski and snowboard team to gather and analyze some unique performance data. We sit down with the visionaries who are using machine learning to optimize the agriculture industry and chat with the innovators who are changing the way we understand and play the game of golf to talk about what's new and what's in store for the future of machine learning. Pretty exciting today, you know, one of the opportunities we've had in DX over the years is these great conversations with developers, uh, you know, from all walks of life, all companies uh, in the industries, talking about how we work together. And, you know, one of the best things of the job is that opportunity to, to work with developers on frontline problems and new technology areas. So why don't we get started with machine learning? And uh, my understanding is you were up at Snowbird doing some skiing. Let's take a look. What's going on? How about that tram ride? Pretty I never, good, huh? That's a sweet tram. Where, yeah. where am I, man? Yeah. I just woke up. <laughs> I got a plane last night, landed somewhere. Where am I? Well, you're not going to get a better tram ride other than uh, here at Snowbird. And uh, thanks for joining us here at National Academy. We're excited here at PSIA ASI. I mean, we we are the educational arm of the snow sports industry, and we want to we want to anything that drives education forward that can help us deliver a better product out on the snow, we want to be a part of. We have our top pros, our top athletes. We have a national team made up of 13 Alpine skiers. And what we've been doing is we've been putting these uh, sensors on them, as well as we've been putting our sensors on our members, our ski instructors who are out here skiing with them. And what we're really trying to do is we're, we're gonna find out, um, evaluate their movement patterns, what makes these national team members the best and then overlay that information and, and take a look at how can this give the general public a visual to become better at the sport they're doing. Yeah, this is pretty cool from the tech side. So, so normally when we think about sort of capturing sort of IoT or you know, the puck here uh -huh. device data, um, people think about sort of low frequency. Hey, did somebody turn a switch on or right. off? And not very often. Yeah. The notion of sort of having an IoT device at high frequency is sort of an interesting problem because you got to capture people as they're coming down the mountain. And so right. the team's done a good job of, of building a sensor that operates at high frequency, low cost, that we can attach to the, the skier or right. the skis, and then connecting it through Bluetooth to the phone, which is pretty cool because right. that gives you the high frequency part. Then feeding that all up to the cloud in Azure so that we can collect all the data. We have sort of a very high uh, amount of data that then we can go run machine learning models against. Right. Over time, you think about applying proactive or predictive to this, a little bit of AI, yeah. and really sort of in the ear of somebody coming down and saying, hey, that last turn, you know, you leaned in a little bit too far, or you did something a little wrong, you know, and the next one changed a little bit based on your style and your skiing right, and, right. and what the pros do. So really cool to sort of take the best of sort of IoT, Bluetooth, sort of connection up to the cloud, um, so there are the Azure side, the machine learning side, big data side. So for us, fun technology, pulls right, right, all right. the pieces together yeah. for, for you and, and the rest, uh, sort of how do we think about the athletes and, and, and to your point, training and education, pretty slick partnership combination. We're excited, I mean, all the members and, and our teams that have been out there, when the Microsoft team has been like, hey, here's the phone, here's the app, and they're like, wait a minute, this is real time, they can see this immediately. It's kind of blowing people's minds, the possibilities that are out there. So we're looking forward to seeing what, bringing this thing to life and seeing what it can do for us. So why is this important to you guys? Being the arm of education for the snow sports industry, we really want to be at the forefront of any innovation. Our charge is to grow the snow sports industry, to get people to be safe and have a good time out there. And if this is something that can help them be better, we want to be a part of it. All right. Well, look, I'm all about getting better. Let's go out and test this out. I'm, I'm interested to see if I can get better Looking out here. forward to it. Let's do all it. All right, let's go. Yeah. You ready to get suited up and go skiing? All right, let's go skiing. All what right. we got here? Well, we have the sensors. So okay. what I'm going to be doing is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put them on uh, your upper body here. Okay. They're going to be evaluating your upper body movements. And I we'll see. also put these on your knees. Yeah. And uh, from there, yep. they will be able to track all your body movements. Every time we do a run, yep. what you're going to do is you're going to push that red button there. Got it. 
started sensor tracking experiment 13. Experiment 13. You ready to go skiing? That's me. Time to go learn something. Let's go skiing. Let's go skiing. Yeah. Pure fall line, straight down to where all those people are. Straight down. Straight down. Okay. And you'll just follow me. Okay. Hit. Ready to go? Yeah, hold on. Started sensor Let's tracking go. Let's do it. Experiment 20. Yeah, nice. It's perfect. Yeah, so we'll take one more run and okay. get a couple more shots. And yeah, let's take a look at the data. Okay. You can see all the sensors on your body. Right. You can see where they're hooked up, two under your knee, two on your elbows, or below your right. elbows. And right. You can see how many test quick cases we've done. Right. So. And it's telling me, it told me the amount of vertical. I think it told me max speed. I wasn't Oh, yeah, no, it, the app tells all that. Max speed, vertical, all of that. I thought it was cool, because when you when you passed, I heard it said you hit 900. Yeah, yeah, 900 feet. Feet or Yeah, that's pretty funny. All right, push that sensor again. Okay, yeah, which way are we going? And we're gonna do a little bit shorter radius turn, and you follow me this one, and then we're gonna do one okay. more. Here, here we go. Okay. Oh. Yeah, nice. Well, let's head on down to the base area, and we'll, okay. we'll check out the data. That was a good day, huh? Uh, good day, yeah. 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 Uh -huh. And now we have all the data on sort of how I was skiing, so we can right. flip it back to the software guys and right. see what the data tells us. Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to seeing that, and that's where it's gonna help us education-wise the best. Well, look, I, you know, personally, I think I was as good as Nick, but I'm really curious to see what the data says. Well, let's take a look. What we wanted to do is spend some time looking at how we can use machine learning to understand if people are doing a good job skiing or not. Yes, John, we actually created uh, an open source uh, sensor kit to enable anybody, all app developers, to connect to uh, sensors to gather that data and then upload it to the cloud and use the machine learning models. Okay, so. It's going from the skis to an Azure SQL database. We also partnered, uh, John, with the Professional Ski and Snowboard Instructors of America to, to actually analyze this data and make a really smart machine learning model that really enables skiers to understand the movement. OK, so let's go into Azure Machine Learning Studio. We'll start with a blank experiment. And I need to import some data. I'm going to just drag that over here. and. You said it was in an Azure SQL database. SQL database. And put that database server name yep. in. And for the database name, you can use our sensor study. And then we're going to select uh, oh, yeah. some gotta, of the data. We got to get that query in. It's actually pack. very, very helpful that the Machine Learning Studio provides a way to, uh, to provide that initial query. This is how we get the data out of that database. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, there we go, save. save. At this point in time, we got the data. We now, uh, I know you and Patty spent a little bit of time on this doing some processing with some of the key kind of R libraries, these exactly. packages. Exactly, yeah. So what we need to do is we need to import one of those packages, and then we're going to run a script that Patty came up with to do the data. Now, this is a set of R scripts. Mm -hmm. So execute uh, R. Execute R script. R script, yep. And all we need to do now is we need to pump that into here, right? Yep. And import the data in, and now we've got an R script. This is the default. That's what the machine learning studio gives you. Yeah, so yep. we're going to just kind of nuke that. We'll and, use patties. and let's use patties. This is the other thing she said we have to do. Um, so I'm just going to go grab this. Tell me about what's going on here. Yeah, we're taking data directly from the sensors and mapping them to composite features ah. within our data model. So for example, I'm really looking at a ski instructor, I'm really looking at the uh, upper body rotation, for example, or I'm looking at the feet position. So this is the difference between the hands. Yeah. You're grabbing the 48th row in the 100 column. Yeah, <laughs> so that's all this raw data. Excuse you're doing the difference, and that gives you the difference in x, y, and z, and then you're storing it into that data set. So the amazing things, uh, thing about this data is that, John, we were able to identify two 2,070 features specific to scheme uh, just by analyzing the data. And, and those features is exactly what you're mapping to. Yeah. Now what we'd like to do is we'd like to train a model on this. And we'd like to see if that model could be used to predict whether or not Googs is going to be a good skier. Exactly. That's, that's exactly what we're trying to look at. We got this data coming in. We're going to want to train it, but we're going to want to train it on only a part of the data, and yep. then we're going to want to look at the other piece in order to check our predictions. And that's pretty straightforward to do. We're just going to split it 70-30, and let's execute the results of that R script down to the split data. And now let's go to that model, train the model. Yeah. 
So train and machine learning model that we're going to train. And we're going to train that model with that 70% of the data. This is a pretty simple data set. And so we'll do the, the really simple one because yep. we kind of know binary. We'll do the two-class logistic regression model. Mm -hmm. We'll pull that over here. And that's an input. That algorithm then becomes an input into the training model. In order to do an evaluation, we're going to need kind of two scores. We're going to need the score that we got from the training data. Mm -hmm. And we're going to need the score that we get from the data that wasn't used in the training set, because that'll exactly. give us an idea of whether or not we actually know what we're doing here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out those two score systems. So we'll have one here, huh? and we'll have one here. And we'll connect this one to the Sending this, one to this data right there. Yep. And we'll have as input the model, right? Uh -huh. And Same then we got to do one more, which is now we need to use this yeah. one. This one over here. Yeah. And then let's take that non-trained data. Yeah. All right, now we need to do the last little step here, which is evaluate that model, right? Yep. And that takes the two inputs. And uh, I think we're actually ready to go do some machine learning and try it out. Anything else we think we ought to do? Yeah, just, just one last thing. So remember, John, when we when we created the features, yep. one of the features we, that we created was actually called the skill level. Yes. So what we want to do is we want to go into oh, yeah, our yeah, train model. Right, so exactly. And, and select that um, skill level. If you type in skill level, this is one of the composite features that we identified to tell. To distinguish good, between exactly. Googs and yes. the pro. Exactly. Let's take a look at the results. Oh, that's an incredible score. So we actually have an incredible accuracy here, John. Close to 99% accuracy. I think what it's saying is it's pretty easy to tell the difference between Googs yeah. and a professional skier. That, that's, is that what we're much. really saying here? OK. Now, what I wanted to do is I want to spend a minute or two talking with our data expert, Patty. Absolutely. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, John. Hey, Patty. So you're looking at the model. Yeah, this is pretty incredible. Oh, the results are great. There's great variation between these body positions and uh, patterns of an intermediate versus a pro. So what you can see here with Googs is that it's markedly higher. So he kept his, his body upright versus the pro who was crouching, leaned into the hill, and a real significant difference between those two here. I also use um, Jupyter Notebooks. And this is a cool tool because it, it really keeps your analysis and your story and your narrative clean and allows you to kind of collaborate around your findings um, with others and, and really push it to the next level. One of the things that I like to look at um, when I'm kind of understanding a model, here we're understanding the variance. This tells us what the most important variables are between the pro and the intermediate. That's right. So wow, that that's you, fascinating. This shows you at a high level the variation in the model and how many components of variation it takes to explain the, the, your model. Ah. And what this tells you with this nice sweet curve is that, yes, with, with a small subset of variables, you can really tell a very clear story. And then this next piece is uh, mapping the components of variance with each of the variables. So each of the variables here is um, labeled on one of these uh, uh, arrow vectors in blue. Okay. Um, and so we can understand the, the story of that variance. So, so what you see here is this really nice differentiation. So what you see over here on the right side is the pro and, and then the kind of that. that wow. uh, uh, it's really lesson. that stark. But this is beautiful. You can read these and develop kind of an intuitive notion of what the variations are. It seems like machine learning and artificial intelligence is going to be very rich and as a tool to help people improve their performance and do other things. Oh, yeah. It's really exciting. I think this is just, just the beginning. We really appreciate you guys coming. As, as John and I always talk about, we love the conversations we get to have with the folks we get to work with. Um, why don't we start off with just a little introduction with from everybody. I'm Kevin Grant, Chief Technology Officer for Farmer's Edge. Farmer's Edge works in what we call the decision agriculture space. We manage grower data, trying to optimize decisions on the farm to maximize profit, um, minimize cost. Hi, I'm Sal Sayed. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Arcos Golf. And what Arcos is, is a hardware and software platform for golfers. It tracks all their data, and then using all that data helps them make better decisions in terms of club selection or understanding their strengths and weaknesses. Tell us a little bit about how you got started working with Microsoft. What was the kind of business problem you were thinking about mm -hmm. where AI might apply? 
when you look at the history of golf, 100 years ago, every single round was played with a caddy. Today, less than 3% of rounds are played with caddies. And the idea what the caddy was doing was helping you make optimal decisions in terms of your club selection. Every time you step up to the ball, what club should you hit? Today, golfers are kind of doing that on their own. And we thought the perfect ap application of all the data that we're collecting is using machine learning to make that decision that much smarter, that much more intelligent. Actually, not unlike the story we just heard, um, when you're in farming, you rely a lot on your data and a lot on expertise. So uh, your farmer has trusted advisors, um, like their fertilizer reps and their seed reps and um, people of that nature. In the past, you've had kind of these mom and pop ag agronomy shops that could service 20,000 acres or 30,000 acres. And what we want to do is we want to take that model and be able to service, you know, a quarter million acres per rep. We really feel, and this is going to sound a little cliche, but we feel like this is a market that's really ripe for disruption. Um, so there's a lot there's of... A pun in there. Too. Yeah, he's ripe and Farming, but we'll just keep going. Cliche and pun all in one. We're, you're on a roll, go. There's a lot of sort of old truisms in agriculture um, and people that will um, do things because that's the way it's always been done or that's um, been the advice. And um, through no fault of their own because they don't have any additional information. Well, now we do. We're collecting you know, real-time equipment data, um, whereas before you might have collected a yield map at the end of the season and maybe an as-applied map at the start of the season. Take all of that data, push it through a machine learning algorithm and see what comes of it. And we're still relatively early yeah. days into this whole machine learning movement, but it's already had a fairly considerable impact in terms of some of our modeling algorithms and whatnot. And what kind of impact are we talking about? Is it cost? Is it increase yields? We want to get as much yield as possible um, for a given amount of fertilizer. And in order to do that, we need to know where to put that fertilizer. Are you getting feedback from other sensors in the in the farmer's setup? So maybe the combines or some of the other machinery that's out there? Definitely. So we're measuring stuff off of the equipment all of the time. The whole modeling piece has been a bit of a revolution for us where we simply don't have to measure it. Um, we can predict it. Like if you can get the data to the algorithms, they often just surprise you in, in new and exciting ways. Are you thinking ahead to doing some deep learning on this, or where, where do you see this going? We're sitting on hundreds of terabytes of data, um, you know, quickly moving into petabytes. I, I think we're going to need to look to uh, the complexity of deep deep learning, TensorFlow, those, those sorts of things, to uh, really take us to the next step of innovation. One of the things we love doing are these hack fests, where we get your engineers in a room with our engineers. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about how that went. What was eye-opening to me was how quickly, if you have the data, that you can get all these insights. You can actually predict outcomes at a very interestingly high rate. So for example, right now, with 70% certainty, I can tell you before you've taken a swing whether you're going to get a par on that hole or not. Wow. <laughs> That's not good in my case. <laughs> I don't get I'm enough pars, so this is, gonna, this is just all going wrong. <laughs> It helped us realize the power of machine learning because we hadn't gotten our hands dirty till then. Then it became our mission, like, okay, wow, this is so powerful. We have all this data. We're going to build the world's smartest caddy. I would say it influenced our product direction. We actually are currently doing a bit of a hack test at the IoT Innovation Lab. It's really about having our devices be able to communicate to the platform, get that data to flow in in, in, in just models so that we can get it to the machine learning. Yeah, there's nothing I find more powerful than getting a bunch of developers in a room mm. with that mix of experience and then working together to solve, right, solve exactly. the problem. It goes so much faster than you know banging your head against the wall by yourself. Now, I'm sure it didn't all go perfectly well. What were some of the challenges you had to overcome? I'd say one of the things that if there was an option to undo a model, it would save us a lot of time. Um, and then maybe version control. Yes. How do you guys think about sort of either low bit rate or, or sort of, you know, connectivity in general for the farmers and helping them figure that out? Because that's one of the hard problems when you think about large spaces and, um, you know, low power sensors. So that actually turns out to be one of our biggest challenges, especially in the other world areas where you have very... Uh, limited cellular coverage and, and things like that. We might be out there collecting data for hours and hours and hours, and we have to store that data locally. But yes. then when we get back, you know, we won't don't want to run the battery down on the tractor. What we're trying to get it pushed up, and so, you know, yeah. there's some things that that are pretty tough to solve out there. That notion of sort of compute on the edge and compute in the cloud is one that we're we're pretty focused on right now as a pattern we see growing over time. And you're yeah. you're literally on the edge of that conversation. That, that is exactly um, so are you in many ways, you know, yeah. with the, the fringe. And one of the great things about the role is talking to you, talking to many other companies, we we hear feedback on how we should improve. And 
it's great to be able to collect that together mm -hmm. and then bring it back to the engineering teams. And in a lot of cases, maybe even build some of the pieces so that we can, we can help the companies you know, make more rapid progress. The uh, sort of machine learning and AI, it, it's, it, it will have an impact on sort of all horizontal sort of you know, business processes or, or sports processes. It'll hit every industry out there. It's, it's gonna be a more exciting time in this space. I'd love to get your thoughts on what you see. Just, you know, if you go out a year, two years, three years, the things that you get excited about in this space. One thing we're seeing is a renegotiation between, of the interaction between the human and the computer. So if we look even 20 years ago or 25 years ago, all of the insight and all of the decision came from the person and the computer was just kind of a dumb servant to, uh, to help them along. And what we're seeing now is almost a reversal. A machine might not be able to say why, why? something's yeah. happening, but they can say that something's happening. And and at that point, we need to send the agronomist out to, uh, um, to help. I know people often worry about, you know, what's, whether AI is going to be displacing uh, people. But, like, I think this is a great example where it, it, it actually augments the capability of that agronomist. I'd like to build on that. First thing we're doing is making golfers smarter by helping them make smarter decisions. But the reality is this data that we're capturing, um, we're tracking everywhere the golfer is going, when they're playing, what clubs they're using, how are they playing, this is gonna make the entire industry more efficient. And I, I would say that exact theme is gonna play out in literally every single industry where um, the decisions are gonna be that much smarter, and as a result, the economies are gonna be that much more efficient. That notion of AI complementing you know, human capability and, and business outcomes, it's just a ton of fun, and it's an area where I couldn't be more excited, and we appreciate you guys making the time to join us today, both of these spaces. We both love to eat. John's a, a key foodie here, and I'm, I actually like to play a lot of golf, so this is win-win, and uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's keep going together. We appreciate it. Keep up the good work. Thank Thanks. 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 Thank you. All right, it's great. Are you going to be at the players? I am. Are you okay. going to be there? Yeah, are you with the Microsoft yeah, guys? Yeah. So I'm coming out Thursday awesome. after Thanks, build, so I can play Friday with you guys. All right, perfect. So, so I'll, I'll see you out there. there. Yeah. There is a company in the south of France, I can't remember their name there, that's putting these low... Um, frequency networks all through the U.S. Sigfox. And for, Sigfox. Yeah. So we know those guys were. We spent a decent yeah. amount of time with them. But that solution is being built for your use case. This little startup that we talked to at the Imagine Cup, you guys might be interested in them. The guy from Starbucks was there. He was looking at what they had done and said, wow, this would be actually quite compelling to us as we grow coffee all over the world. And the challenge is how do you set up that mesh network? How do you get it to all operate at very low cost? If you're interested, we'd be happy to just yeah, do I'd some connections. On the next episode of Decoded, we invite a new set of thought leaders to the round table to play with what's new, talk about what's being built, and see what's in store for the future of mixed reality. <laughs> <laughs>